This is a talk I'm going to be giving in France uh, over uh, in Carcassonne, which is the area of Montségur and the area of the Cathars, the area of the romance of the Grail. And so I was excited to be able to uh, just see where the ideas would take us tonight uh, because I've really spent a lifetime, I don't know about anybody else, but I grew up loving knights. I, everything having to do with knights and armor and Camelot. And that's why I really, I, I, I wanted to start tonight with that wonderful line, don't let it be forgot that once there was a spot. For one brief shining moment there was once a Camelot. And that stuck with me all my life. Uh -huh. That longing for some place, some time, some hope that was somehow lost. A moment, a, a little scene, and then it disappears. And it becomes part of the romance of the human heart. And that's why a lot of this, and this is looking up at Montsegur, and this is the last Cathar stronghold. This is also where we're going to see a lot of the Grail legends. The Grail is supposedly part of the treasure that in the last siege where the Cathars are about to be uh, destroyed finally by, by the, uh, the Catholic, the Pope's troops, uh, we find that the Grail treasure is, of course, taken in the dead of night to disappear again into history's mystery. And that's why I love the romance of this and the story of the Cathar heresy, the romance of Arthur and Camelot, because this really is the story of the Grail. And the beautiful thing is, the more one looks into the Grail, the more universal you realize the stories and the symbols and how you really can look across and to understand this sense that in our human imagination, the story of the round table, the story of the quest. And in the Grail tradition, Merlin is the one who creates the round table and Arthur gathers his knights and they're able to actually vanquish the outer world in the wars. And the question is, but what about the inner world? What about the inner grail? What about this mystery, this possibility? And that's why the story will take us really where we are looking at in this illustration, of course, uh, of the grail, this artist's interpretation. And the beautiful thing about the grail is it's sometimes talked about as a dish. It's sometimes the stone in one uh, tradition. It's the stone that falls from Lucifer's crown, the emerald that falls while Satan and God are battling. And so as he is trapped in the world to bring forth evil, the grail, the chalice, becomes the stone of heaven and the transmutive force to perfect that which has fallen into darkness. And that's why it's very interesting to see this round table because we think of the circle, we think of how this story of the gathering of the worthy is repeated in this story that begins actually back with the cup of Christ. Now we know, and what will be very interesting is that you have two, really two grails. You'll have the cup of Christ, the blood of Christ, which if we think of as the masculine qualities, and then you have the blood of Mary, you have the chalice of life. And so you'll have two qualities of the blood that it's actually starting to get at. And that's why in the Grail myth, in, and there are different variations, of course, of them, Joseph of Arimathea, who's an, a wealthy Jew, is given um, uh, Christ's body after he's been crucified, and he's, he's cleaning it, he's preparing it. And that what happens is that, uh, of course, the body disappears. Uh, he's accused of stealing the body, and he ends up being thrown in jail. Well, the, the point is that before, when he was cleaning the body, the, the wound of Christ opens, and so he gathers into this vessel the blood and water of Christ. And that in a vision in the, in the, in the jail, essentially Christ appears to him and instructs him in the ways of the Mass and the secrets of the Grail. And Joseph of Arimathea, in one tradition, sets off on a great adventure and lands in what we think of as ancient Britain and ends up in Glastonbury, creating the first church dedicated to Mary. So we have this beginning of the cult of Mary as well, which is very interesting historically because we have a very limited perception. But it's the beginning of the cup of Christ, this sense of the quest of the whole Grail. And this is going to be the great challenge of the knights, the sense of not taking the easy path, coming out even though it's raining cats and dogs. That's the key. We set out beyond the boundaries into the ancient forests where there is no path. And the Grail knights would not follow in each other's steps. And they would not enter the easy part of the forest. They would take the most difficult because they realized that theirs was not to achieve something. It was to become worthiness itself. 
And this becomes then the perfecting of the stone that we'll see and this relationship, of course, to the inner worlds and the desire when we think of that inner desire. What is this divine desire? Why am I driven? Why do I have this great desire for the, the grail? And we see, of course, the grail is also the feminine. And in this painting of Dante Gabriel Rossetti's, we see her really holding the chalice, which is the divine feminine, mm. which is she's saying. And this is what's going to take us into this great tradition, because one of the things we don't really understand is that the grail traditions come out of a time of courtly love, come out of a time of chivalry and chivalric orders. As a matter of fact, Arthur was all about chivalry. And that's why uh, Parsifal is called the divine fool, because he, to begin with, picks up a club and knocks a noble knight off of his, his horse and takes his armor and rides into town and doesn't know why everyone shuns him. And of course, they say, because any idiot can knock a knight off his horse with a club. There's no art in that. You dishonored him, and you dishonor the armor. Remove it. Humble yourself. You are not worthy because you take. You are worthy because you develop. And that's in alchemy and everything else. It's cultivation. Nothing is entitled. That all consciousness is grown. And that's what she's saying. She's saying, I am the first principle. I am life. I am the knowledge of the blood. I am the knowledge of not one time, but all time. So in your blood, in the knowledge of the deep feminine, is the knowledge beyond time, because I am the source of every age. And that's where we see in this troubadour lyric, which I love, to Our Lady, because women were not put below men in courtly love. That a knight would choose a lady usually beyond his caste, meaning she was impossible, she was unachievable. And so he could not have her. And uh, the troubadours sing, and it's wonderful, they sing these songs about how tortured they are by the woman because she will disdain him. And of course, that makes him yearn for her more. And this whole uh, dance between the passion of this story of the beloved one is the heart's highest grail. Think of that. Now, that's heresy. The beloved one is the heart's highest grail. Her lover, her lover, will not be alone, for she is to him the highest grail, which protects from every woe. And do you see what he's doing there? He's saying, I have given myself to love. I do not give myself to the authority of another man who tells me he is in charge and therefore I'm a supplicate. That turns me into a soldier. That's no warrior. I discern. I honor and serve that which is worthy of being served. And that's the true son. Do you see? That's this relationship that we will see more and more about honoring and nobility. And that's why we see in the old uh, image here of the knight and the lady. You know, you think of the lady putting her handkerchief on the lance of the knight. That was more than just ritual. That really was about this relationship, because romantic love really begins in this time. The sense of the yearning love, you know, not the, not the love of, of arranged marriages, but really that sense of the love that cannot be known, cannot be had, but we still yearn for that. Now think of that as developing, because this is what we're going to see in the Gothic cathedrals as well, this yearning, this vaulted desire that will bring out a certain genius that we sadly lack at this point, or I should say we possess in a different form. Um, but this is, this is, of course, this is one of my favorite, uh, William Morris, one of the, uh, and Ed Byrne-Jones, Byrne who, of course, uh, were the pre-Raphaelites, and they loved all of the grail themes. And, but we will see that in the story, Galahad ends up being really the only one worthy of the grail. And he's always rather otherworldly, because he's the son of Lancelot. And Lancelot gets close to the grail, but the grail blinds him you know, momentarily because what happens is he sees his adulterous desire for Guinevere and makes him unworthy of actually seeing the grail, of touching the grail. Now Galahad, who's Lancelot's son, is born very pure and sort of has this otherworldly effect. And so what he does, of course, is he is able to attain the grail, but then basically disappears. The grail never comes back to Camelot. And that's what's interesting. One night does, the Boers comes back to Camelot, but he's considered the ordinary man. So the ordinary man comes back, did not bring the grail, 
but did bring the stories of the grail. And I think that's what we bring to generation. That's why in the beautiful illuminated text, we'll see this is one of the pages devoted to the story of Lancelot and just how beautiful, because the whole point in our arts was that if you say something beautifully, you're revealing far more about the deeper beauty of what you're expressing than a thousand words could. And that's why everything had a certain beauty to it. And that's what we see here with the story of the minstrels, of the troubadours, going from court to court, spreading the, the story of the song of love, of amour, and of the nobility, of the quest for the grail. And that's why when we look at the cathedrals, what is so fascinating with Notre Dame, and you think of Notre Dame, it's what, Our Lady. And when we enter a cathedral, we don't, we've lost the magic. We're entering her. We're returning to the celestial womb. That's what the grail is. It's all of this story that when we lost a lot of our connections, we started to, in a way, uh, sublimate a lot of that. But not these cults, not the cults of Mary, not the, uh, uh, um, uh, the what was the free, uh, um, just different, free, no, the, uh, uh, even before that. There were just different societies, different uh, areas, and that's what the Cathars were. Why they were a heresy, is they believed in the equality of men and women. They believed in the relationship of the self being the, the fundamental source of union, that you did not need an outer source, you needed an inner source, and you needed to be true to that inner source, which outer authority found highly, <laughs> highly resentful. It's like, hmm, I think you need me. But this, this sense also of, as I was saying, the vaulting of our imagination. When we stand in front of a cathedral, we're really not looking at something we can apply our own vision to, but we're looking at vision itself. And when you can put your suspension of disbelief about why I need to know this, and really put yourself in relationship to it, you'll begin to have a lot of what we see, and this is where the story of the grail, the story of alchemy, the story of what we'll see with Thoth's library, is that we start to see this fundamental relationship of story, a type of multi-temporal uh, uh, narrative, meaning things are all going on at once but they're stable. They're not in motion, we are. It's the opposite of our technological age where we're stable sitting at a computer and everything's in motion and we wonder why we can't concentrate. <laughs> it's because we're being swept away. And part of all magic, alchemy, all of the ancient arts was about concentration. And if you think about a performance, if you can't concentrate, you're going to kind of float out of the third act. You have to find a way to stay centered. And that's why we see this relationship and this story of Christ and why I love the Gothic period, because the Gothic is the living cathedral. And why it's so important to think about is that the, the, the Vesca, that's the creation, excuse me, of two interconnecting spheres, that he's actually, that's the birth opening, essentially created by heaven and earth. And that Christ becomes the mediary between, we'll see the four astrological fixed symbols because astrology was part of the ancient church. It wasn't rejected and a lot of the myth that has grown up around this really remarkable vision that has become so uninteresting when in fact this deeper value which was always attended to was where we found the great storytellers saying, some of us will understand that when we see three, we will begin to see that there is, if we look at it alchemy, alchemically, salt, sulfur, mercury, or there is earth, heaven, and, and the divine. So we have this relationship of the picture language and how it will take us into the windows, into the wheels. And I wanted to point this out, this figure, this watcher figure, this entity, because this becomes, in the work upstairs, the nature of the language that creates the hieroglyph of the human soul. And it will actually be as if that which was formal, structural, has come into motion and begun to take us once again on a journey that is the stones are here, the fixed forms are here, the instrument is here. What you must trust now is not the form, but the, the quality of consciousness within that form. Not what you see, but the energy that animates you. And that's, of course, the spiritual quest, essentially. That's why the windows, we'll start to see the relationship to the rose window. Why this becomes visual philosophy, and this is why it was such a time of genius, was it was saying, you can look at this as just say it's pretty. And it is, it's beautiful. But the more you listen to it, the more you're willing to have a conversation with it, the more it begins to reveal itself. And that's why in the ancient Pythagorean schools, you were given a, a geometrical glyphs and five years of silence 
to contemplate the language of geometry not as a story being told by a professor, but literally think of your own empathetic energy finally getting it, oh, this isn't something I'm studying. This is another part of myself that exists in this language. And this is what a lot of these ancient uh, languages were about, what picture language, hieroglyphics were about, where they're saying we're creating tuning forks, meaning we don't want you to see this one way, but to begin to read a mythic narrative. And because of that, because it is beautiful, we can tell stories on all levels. And that was the great, in a way, the great um, service and the great um, subversiveness of art. Because when you read the language, when you actually know the picture language, you start going, oh my god, they're getting away with it. <laughs> they're actually surrounding us with greater knowledge than, in a sense, the managerial department wanted us to have. <laughs> but in spite of that and, that, and you see that from everyone, from Michelangelo to the alchemist, to the sense of, of that if you don't react against and you distract a bit, then you say what needs to be said so beautifully that they can't hang you for it. And that was the point of beauty. And that was actually the tool of beauty. And then we you know, opted for utilitarianism. I don't get it. But that's the, uh, the sense here of the vaulted uh, imagination again, this Gothic sense of reaching higher and higher. And think of it here, the sense of as above, so below, this sense of from the below, we reach for that which we cannot touch. And if we think of this even as the development of a unique ego, a unique story, because that's what the grail is, right? I have to find out my way in the forest. I have to find my way of doing this. I have to know how to. And that's that vaulting sense of the reach beyond one's grasp. And this is where we move into alchemy. And I wanted to share some of the, the language of alchemy to begin to talk about why, from the grail myth of the chalice of the knights of the round table, we'll start to see this same story being told in alchemy and hermetic tradition, which is saying that there is an instrument within us, a knowledge of the squaring of the circle, which can see the worldly realm within which we live, within the square of the condition. But if we realize a greater perspective, we'll begin to able to see not just uh, what we are involved in, but essentially be able to see that story, the greater story. And this is the Integra Natura, which is the story of Sophia. And I wanted to show this as a way of talking about how we modeled looking at the relationship of the imagination as an environment. Notice how all things like the cathedral are going on at the same time. Part of that is to say that we want to be able to hold these qualities. And for the imagination, the lion and the sun, these, these images of drawing down the blood. Now think of the blood of Christ, do you see? The wound. Think of that sense of the sun, the sun of Christ, right? So you have a picture of the sun. The lion is another metaphor of Christ, the nobility of the spirit. But also you think about the lion. It's, it's, it's full of force. It cannot be controlled. It's natural. So we're actually looking at a much more complex story if we allow ourselves to use analogy and correspondence. And that's what all of this was based upon. And that's why these stories of, of the king and queen of the bath of purification, the dove of the Holy Spirit, the crossing of, of spirit and nature, and the elevation, as we can see here, of the moon and the sun, and again of the Holy Spirit bringing together in relationship or harmony that sense of the, the union that I really feel this helps us understand. Part of the grail mythology really is this part of the womb. And we think, well, what is that? What, what is this, this search for the nobility? What is this sense of, because there's a lot of, in, in a, mental martial arts and a lot of this, there's a type of Aikido. There's a type of you're going this way. Think of a wave. You're going this way. But you reach a point where you must do this. You know, you must come back. You can't keep going that way. And a lot of this has to do with masculine and feminine energies, meaning that, that here we see the sun and moon in the waters. She is being receptive to him within the waters. But this is not the end of this. This is actually an exaltation that will lead to her, do you see, above him with wings. And she gives him wings as well. But he is now in a relationship where he is honoring her. He is not on top of her. He is actually below her. And this is, again, this story of the relationship that leads us to these wonderful images of the phoenix of the pelican, the story of Christ, again, in a picture language, the sense of the blood of Christ. The pelican pecks open its own chest. So a lot of your images, when you see a pelican, mm -hmm. it's saying, this is a symbol of Christ, because Christ shed his blood to nourish 
the hungry. And that's why in this, so many of the symbols have to do with the Christ Sophia, the masculine and feminine, the grail of, of the mother, and the knowledge of the grail of the blood of the, of the Christ. And that we finally stand upon a world that is devouring itself. We see strength here, but we also see how we have the androgen, this two-headed figure with the wings of a bat. So what do the wings of a bat say? You can see at night. What is the four? You bring the four worlds together. The lion, strength, again, Christ. You have risen in Christ to hold the story of this 11, uh, the blossom of 11. And you think of the pears there and the 11th being, the fulcrum meaning I can hold. And if you think of this, uh, the Kabbalah, of course, which is very uh, well known at this point as well, we have the ten sephiroth and the invisible sephiroth of death, meaning that which you must develop uniquely. You must trust your subjectivity because only that will draw together and create a story that you can live with. And that's why I'm just I'm not going to, but I want to show you the circle, the relationship to the parts, because this is really what so triggers my work that will be a question with the tarot. But this is, again, is to see how philosophically we looked at things visually. And that's one of the things about the romance. I really try to tell people now, you know enough. You know, it's almost like, think of the romance of it. You don't need to figure this out. This is something that needs to be studied unless you're prone to studying it like I was. It really is meant to be as it was, which is, let this trigger you. And I feel, feel with artists, with painters, with, you know, you don't have to know what you're painting. A lot of times, one of the great keys in alchemy was with the emblems. It said, redraw this by hand. Because your hand, which is ancient, you might have one, but it's a human hand that you have, not your hand. You see? Trust this hand. Because as those lines move through you, you'll start to feel. You'll empathize. You'll begin to feel a curiosity. Oh, that's interesting. That's not, you see? And you start to pull out of yourself through creative quest that which will bring together the story of the Emerald Tablet. And that's why it creates in this story a conversation across time. And we begin with the grail seal I created uh, for my book, which is Arcanum Arcanorum and the Secret of Secrets. And we see the grail, Alpha Omega, and Natura Non Facet Saltus. Now what's interesting is, Natura Non Facet Saltus, I'm having a conversation with Goethe. That was his favorite saying, nature does not grow in leaps. It was very interesting, because you think about acting, when you start having a conversation with character or archetype, you start having a conversation with art, not with the artist, but with the art itself, it starts to open up a dialogue, a curiosity. And that's why a lot of my work is based in this sense of not trying to illustrate anything, but to actually see what if I take these forms that I have seen or that I've been inspired by and begin to look at them. And that's what led to my work on the tarot, the 17 years. But we're going to see the wheel. And one of the reasons why, I'm not going to explain them really, I just wanted to look at archetype, the picture language, symbols as tuning forks. Yeah, yeah. You were mentioning the ancestors, you know, your ancestors. Right. And I mean, looking at my education growing up, nobody ever really talks to you about your own personal ancestors and your lineage going back. Right. You're talking about you can tap into that and how much wisdom there would be in being able to do that. Do you have a suggestion on how person could tap into their I actually, f that's wonderful that you say that right now because I'm going to show you the tarot. One of the th tools I was looking for as an actor was how can I really understand the operating system? You know, not, not over identify, but in a way create permission. Because the great thing about acting and the great thing about inner tradition, if you think about it, is developing permission. You know, in a sense, you fight. If, if you're going to say, I stand as the center of the cosmos, believe me, a lot of you is going to go, <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> you, know, you don't. You don't. And so a lot of it is, in a way, on the acting level of, of suspension of disbelief, going, OK, yeah, I realize that, that I could say on one level I'm making this up. Great. But on the other le level, because I'm allowing it, I'm starting to be informed by uh, qualities that are mentoring me because they're not telling me what or how to do it. They're starting to, between, in a sense, folly and wisdom, both great ideas and silly ideas, they're starting to say, you see, you're starting to engage me. So the best way to really engage the ancestors, in my opinion, is, and this is what I do with my tarot, is I, I have them in a wheel, in a circle around me, and I create the spokes of a wheel. 
and I say that when I see the direction, this direction, this direction, this direction, it's like looking at fellow actors in a play. Oh, I see the devil over there. I see the magus. I see the hermit. But realizing that I am the living wheel, I realize I am all of those characters. And that the access, then, is my imagination. Because we want a type of scientific proof. And the ancestors don't live there. They live in love. They live in the pain and difficulty that we all do, which has nothing to do with time and everything to do with feeling. And that's why in terms of sympathetic magic, the great thing is, and why these images are so important, is they anchor us. In other words, they create a stable form. That's what a cathedral did. Do you know, it anchors us in place. That's what the upstairs does. Actually, that's what home does. It anchors us so we won't be swept away. We won't be drawn into madness. And one of the reasons why many of these other qualities of mind remain, in a sense, behind the veil is they love us, meaning they don't want to sweep you into madness. Only when you're ready. And that's the grail story. Only when you're ready. It's not for everybody. You know, the call is for many, but few are chosen. And that becomes the sense of, oh, I get it. Then maybe I'm asking my questions too grandly. I have to start more intimately. And that's why I think putting the wheel around one creates that sense of the theater of the psyche, and even turning in a circle. Do you see that sense of, oh, I get it. I'm not just what I'm looking at. I'm not just reacting. I'm actually the story of, of taking it in. And then I, I would imagine that sometimes, you know, you'll be drawn to maybe one card in particular, so that, that may be uh, assisting you or connecting you with Yes. Just because it's like and if you are, why not act it? I mean, that's why I like a home. You can close a door. You know, in a way, that's what we've forgotten, that we take the outer world and apply those rules and restrictions to ourselves when we're in our inner world. And a lot of this is actually trying to get us to move away from understanding to understanding, meaning that it is not a grand abstraction. It's actually a simple location. Am I standing in the play? Am I participating with that which is around me? Or am I somehow adjacent? Because every question that we do, bring it back to the center. That's why I suggest dance. Bringing it back, because I think the more synergy, in a sense, more uh, synesthesia we become, the more we blend, the more we dance, we sing, we express out loud, the more we're mentored because we're actually being creative. And we're allowing this thing called spontaneity to guide us. Mm -hmm. So that's and connecting you right there. Yeah, and that's what this is really trying to get at, is how do we you know, actually understand the keys to the theater of the psyche? Yeah, and that's why, and thank you, because that actually leads into this story of the seed. And we'll start to see again, I'm not going to go through these because in a way it's a picture language that to a great degree is self-evident if we start looking at it. It's a seed with, as above, so below. So a seed is planted. No, I told my, my daughter, I said, use the strength archetype. Take the visualization, visualize it. This is what we don't, you know, it was wonderful. Our, Lawrence Olivier uh, had, a, had a walk on part, and you know, he, was, he was a young actor, and he, he knew he was just being ignored, and so he, he thought, what can I, what can I do? And he, and he started to imagine this bright orange flag coming out of the top of his head. And what was fascinating was he said he became absolutely riveting. Everyone couldn't, they said, who's that kid in the third act? What's he doing? And it, all he was doing was adjusting. And, and supposedly Marilyn Monroe had that capacity to turn it on, turn it off. And that's the key to the imaginative body. We're so locked in because we're taught to be real, whatever the hell that means. And the thing about the tarot, which is great about it, it says when somebody asks you to be yourself, you say, okay, which one? You are going be all those characters. And that's really important because that's when we reclaim the operating system. The car starts to move. We're not just saying, hey, the door is great. I really relate to the archetype of the door. It's like, it's not about the archetype of the door. It's about the bloody vehicle. Take it out for a spin, for Christ's sake. And that's why this, this was my spin of 17 years. And again, as above, so below, the inside of the egg, the high priestess. And so much of this, as I was working on these, what came to me and what became the upstairs Thoth's library became fundamentally founded in so many of the stories that I'd learned from so many across so many ages. And that's where I found myself in conversation, not with people of my time, but really this greater mind that had across time been saying that symbols are not dead things, they are living. They are meant to tell a story. Now each of these, because I'm not going into the symbolism of them, but I want you to just feel the difference in their energetic shape. That's what a tonk is. That's what all of these things are trying to do. We don't understand that the first thing of a symbol is its tangible symbol. That a lotus is not a symbol of something, a lotus is a living being. 
That's the first and most important part of that symbol. And in the West, we go, well, no, actually, it represents, and is this and that. And you go, no, that's called the, the theater of audience participation. We're interested in the theater of actor participation. So that means you're interested not in what something conceptually means, but actually embodies. And that's the nature of hermetic symbolism. That's the nature of alchemical symbolism. That's the nature of this story of the tarot and why this is, I, you know, I didn't set out to draw this. I set out with the question of the lovers, of what does that mean? And what amazed me was it was like a role that was far beyond my own psychology, stepping into it and going, my God, this person's much more interesting than I am. <laughs> Where did that come from? And that's something that I feel that, that we are locked in a way in our imaginations with this sense of, because you think of girl, boy. Now think of the tarot, man, woman. And what if that's been moving across the time, like a wheel, do you see? saying that this question's been growing. Is it man, woman? Is it bit? Well, actually, there's much more involved. There are many more notes between just this or that. Do you see? And finally, these keys, finally, these notes come full circle. And we start to be able to speak in a picture language that says, begin to look at me in terms of what you feel to begin with. And my dad would say something. He was a painter, and he said, it was a wonderful thing to me. He said, he said don't tell me what you're looking at. Tell me how you feel about what you're looking at. And that's what he'd tell me as an artist. He said, don't describe, suggest. And that's the nature of the grail. That's the nature of alchemy. It's suggestion. There's no description. Because in a way, if you don't have the subtlety to put it together yourself, you know what? Maybe you're not ready. Nothing personal. But not everybody can climb Everest either. <laughs> you know? Not everybody can be a professional basketball player. Most of us aren't tall enough, even if we love playing the game. So it's that. But I wanted to show you here, like the lions here. Now, I started to have a conversation with alchemical imagery of the twin lions. And what was very interesting was as mine developed this quoting of this, it started to tell a different story, or it started to augment that story, and to actually take me not into a, in a sense, soliloquy where I was alone, but into a conversation where I couldn't actually talk to the person drawing it but I knew more about them from their drawing than any amount of words they could have told me. So they were mentoring me silently. Mm -hmm. And that is the mutus liber. That's the silent book. That's trusting the tools. And that's why a lot of this, the hermit, will see. Now think of this all as, as figure, you know, the sense of the character. This is all your psyche. I'm not showing you like, oh, well, the hermit's you and nothing else. This is all you. That's what the, these traditions are saying. You are all of this. And I wanted to show you, as in this, in the Wheel of Fortune I created, this I, I decided I have to quote one of my great inspirations, which is a man named Johann Gistel, who actually illustrated the works of Jakob Verma. And so I took the I, and you see wheels within wheels, because I was doing the same thing, but I wasn't copying, I was having a conversation. And that's the difference. We're in a time of appropriation, which is making it look like so. But what I love is that we'll even see how the eye appears in justice. And we'll see the balance. We'll start to see the hanged man. Do you see the key 12? They're all numbered. Key 13. Now we'll notice here, I took this symbol of an ankh. But I realized in doing that, I took us back to ancient Egypt. So I wasn't having a conversation just in my time by the symbol I was using. I was having a conversation across time. And when I know that, it becomes a tuning fork. Because it's not something, it's allowing the inspiration to emerge. And so it's very interesting, the symbol of life in the uh, archetype of the death, which is, of course, life. Do you see how that story? But that's being told not just in that image, that's actually in conversation. And that's why temperance will, this is very alchemical, which I don't have time to go into, the devil, <laughs> which is self-evident. Um, but I also like that he's very much about worthiness. And the tower is very much about, uh, and if we think about our psyches as well, this is one of the things about archetype, is we really want things to be comforting. And if we realize we are in a small little boat on a seething sea of infinite power, <laughs> an absolute raw resource that doesn't even know what it is imagining, then we have kind of a clue as to why we kind of need some tools not to get swept away. And that's why Joseph Campbell started it, Jung started it, why we're all reading these people, why we're interested is they're saying we're actually cultivating a way of seeing now 
that is beginning to draw tools into our experience that says, listen, if you can relate to archetype, in other words, if you realize this isn't personal, like a captain on a boat realizes the log in the water has nothing to do with him, has everything to do with his boat, meaning he'd better get out of the way, but he doesn't have to get on his knees lamenting, oh, why is the log in the water? There's always a log in the water. The person says, you know what, just navigate. Learn the Aikido of getting out of the way of things. And that's a lot of what we're trying to do, is to understand this relationship. And this is where the tarot so helps us, because it really does open up into starting to see, OK, well, there are three levels. I see that's being split in half. I see that. You know, we start to trust how we see the image. And that's, of course, why the moon archetype is really all about feeling and what we feel. Now, this I, of course, quoted our dear uh, friend Leonardo in The Vitruvian Man. But I wanted to continue the conversation into the double visage, meaning this sense of the drawing down the heaven, that we're not just looking into the man as the measure of all things now, but actually this relationship of the capacity to hold the above and the cross of matter. And this then uh, moves us into uh, judgment. Judgment is this, and actually I highly suggest my book and the chapter on this, because I have to say, and this is also very important, when you're experiencing these things, when, you, when you're thinking about things, start to sense the energy. Now, is it angular? Is it comforting? Is it uncomfortable? That's very telling. It's almost like the senses. And that's why the tarot has a lot to do with olfactory senses, hearing, seeing, because all of those senses of digestion, they all have to do with like strength. It's in your stomach. It's in your gut. Do you feel it? You know, and that, in a way, archetypally triggers you. Oh, I see. Do you see? I can commune with this, because I'm starting to realize that I am composed of these various qualities. And judgment, when I was working on it, I really felt like I was drawing, it, because it's Pluto. It's that which is transpersonal. I could never actually see it. I couldn't figure it. And when I was writing the article, I felt the same way. The chapter, I had this very odd feeling of, if I had to visualize it, I had my eyes closed, and I was writing from the tips of my fingers. And it was almost like that's what this judgment, because it's Shin, it's the life energy. It says, that's the trust I'm asking for. I'm not asking you to do this. I'm asking you to still do it like this. And that's why even that, you see almost like a dance, it starts to have a type of physical relationship. And that's why this has the, the parting of the, in a sense, the, the atomic nature, the kundalini, the rising of the inner sun, reflecting the deep feminine, which opens to the angelic. And finally, we balance the sun and the moon, just in an alchemy, you know, the wisdom of the feminine and the wisdom of the masculine. Because judgment is about that only when you do not judge will you actually be free of who you think you are. Mm -hmm. Because when you discern, you'll realize you're so much more than you thought. Judgment is not what we are seeking. Awareness is what we are seeking. And the world archetype with its twin pillars, its twin towers dated 9-11, 1986. <laughs> and this has to do with Saturn. And in alchemy, we have the stone of Saturn. And the point of Saturn is that first, I insist on your form. You'll call me a devil, because I'm going to keep kicking you until you use your feet right. Once you use them right, I'm going to turn into a very beautiful being. <laughs> And that's the point. In a way, we want to get there in an unworthy fashion. And all of these traditions say, that doesn't happen. And this, uh, the fool will see the chalice again, the grail, and the pouring out of the rainbow, the setting in motion of the phoenix, mm -hmm. and this story of the phoenix, that this relationship to the painting, why I wanted to share this, which I feel is so important, is this mirroring because this is very alchemical, very unexpected, and I believe actually brings us to one of the great mysteries of Thoth's library, is the setting in motion of creation. And you think of the golden section of that sense of the rectangle, the golden rectangle, the iteration that follows its own pattern over and over and over again, until finally, like the phoenix, it holds its nest, it holds its feathers, and we then, realize that we have come full circle, we have come home. Now, this, why this is important is this is being told to us in what? A picture language, in geometry, mathematics, iteration. This is what the alchemist was, what the grail was trying to say. Everything is a symbol. Nothing is circumstantial. Everything has to do with the womb of your experience, meaning 
the living library of your experience. And that's why as this is triggered, it bursts into flames, just as in the myth of the phoenix. And why this will become so important is I believe this is actually one of the great indicators of the Aquarian revelation that could only come to us through creation or through art, which is that we are blossoming because all of the mandalas that this creates, all of the, 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 the suns, S-U-N-S's, are composed of the same phoenix painting, and yet they are blossoming as uh, infinite suns, S-U-N-S's, and they all have different geometries. And this is very important because the point of the philosopher's stone, the point of the grail, is why does the grail have so many different interpretations? It's saying that any true symbol is not fixed. It's not a sign. It's like love. It says, if you look at me one way, turn me, look at me again, look at me again, look at me again. And that's very essential, and that's what the glasses do upstairs. If you look at me one way, put the glasses on. And that's why all of this leads into the story of finally blossoming as creation, because art is, of course, creation. And that is the key of the grail, that we are dealing with the elements of the artistry of our consciousness, and that we are dealing with wheels within wheels, meaning the structure can finally hold the deeper beauty. And that's the, when we finally ascend, when we hold the journey across the ages and the light of mind, we will return now to Thoth. And that's why I call this the mystery of Thoth's library, is that I began work on the upstairs. It called itself the hieroglyph of the human soul. Well, I started writing a vision statement in 2005, and I wanted to share with you who Thoth Hermes is, because Thoth, or Thoth, is the Egyptian savant. You see him as the scribe. He is essentially Mercury, and these two qualities come together as above, so below, as Hermes Trismegistus, or Hermes the thrice wise. And he will show us this story of the sun and the moon, of the drawing together of the qualities that lead to the wisdom not of one time or one being, but actually of all time and all being, because wisdom is the province not of any one person. It is the province of all persons. And that's this sense of why the visitor that came, the heron that visited in 2005, what is astounding about this is that I wanted to share with you the story that when it came into my home in 2005 and I said, well, there's the back door. Things are very Harry Potterish around here. <laughs> and I flew to the front door and I said, well, my friends already think I'm a bit crazy. So, you know, you can see the way I talk. It probably is a, an indictment. Um, and I said, wait a minute, I got to get a camera. There's, there's a bird in my house. Uh, and I ran upstairs. And what I had was, of course, this marvelous uh, um, experience of him uh, beginning to talk with me. <laughs> and he jumped up behind the, uh, the couch downstairs, and then he jumped down onto the couch, and he said to me, he said, he said you know I'm a bird. And I said, of course I know you're a bird. And he said, I'm a symbol. Yes, I'm a symbol. I said, but what you don't yet realize is that I'm the very quality of consciousness that ascends and returns. I live in more than one world at a time, and the reason I don't speak to you with words is I'm teaching you to trust your inner storyteller. And what is so important about the heron visiting this place that we saw, the Phoenix Arise painting that creates the blossoms, is that it will turn out that Thoth, or Thoth, this figure here, that his, uh, he, it is the heron that is the Phoenix in ancient Egypt, and that Thoth's library is actually the hieroglyph of the human soul, turns out to have the acronym T-H-O-T-H-S, which I was not expecting. So 10 years into creating the work, it turns out that this is Thoth's library. Well, being an artist, I realized a lot of the questions that you can't answer, you have to paint. You have to say, I don't want to have a debate about this. All right, a bird came into my house. It is the ancient Egyptian phoenix. That's the symbol. So why don't I start putting what I experienced into my painting? I'll start having a conversation with it. So it becomes a reoccurring motif of the phoenix. So wherever we see this in any of the painting now, we're actually experiencing the, what I learned from the heron, this story of, the, of birth, of, of life, of the creation of the holographic DNA, and this story, as we see, of the slit eyes and the slit mouth that the DNA reveals here, of the ancients. Do you see how you have the ancient face looking out at us from our own DNA, our own weave? Point to that, to that eye. Oh, yeah. If you can see this, do you see these slit eyes and slit mouth? Do you see that? Mm -hmm. If you can, this, 
This is very important because this is actually getting at, and I feel that that's the whole point of the grail. Because you think of our symbols, it's the weave, it's the cup, it's the chalice, it's the blood, it's the roots. And this is part of the story here is trust the roots, trust that which is ancient, because the forbidden fr uh, fruit, the delicious knowledge of Eve, is the knowledge of life. And the alchemical mother tells us, she says, you are giving birth to me. Everything you consider to be divine is being born from the willingness you take on the adventure you call being human. And do you see that, the sense of a butterfly growing its wings? Not one side being lopsided, but saying, I exist in direct proportion to your curiosity. The world you think is real is completely the outcome of the one you're willing to adventure into. And that's what the Grail Knights knew. They knew that if we don't take the adventure, we have no right to complain. So they took the adventure. And that's what she's saying. And that's where we see the alchemical alembic and this story of she is being born from the conditions she herself is giving birth to. And we ascend into the library. We ascend into the mystery of the, of the watcher figure, the guardian, that will really, of course, take us up into this sense of the mystery of that which has no face. And this is very important to all of our, our, our studies, all of our journeys, is we are seeking that which has no face. Because once we put a face on it, it has a personality, and we have someone to blame. But when we find that which informs us without personality, but with presence, it says, you see, I'm not knocking you out of being center stage. I'm supporting you. You can dance more beautifully. And that's when we trust these energies not to be seen. Do you see how this is the watcher is the figure in the window of the, the Gothic cathedral? It's actually saying now we are present, but we are not uh, uh, making ourselves seen. We are making ourselves felt. And this is, of course, the grail cross. The story of the cross of matter, mater, mother, the weave, the square, meaning that we are weaving with the cross in time and within the circle of our experience that which can finally hold the, the story. And that's what's very interesting. This cross, it turns out, when you count up the number of openings, it's 21. So this becomes the tarot cross, the mysterious book of T, which is saying that if you think of all these sections as the characters, then when you stand here, do you see you are standing in the center of all of this experience? Did you know that when you made that? No. I, and that's what was so interesting. I counted the numbers. I, none of the, I'd love to say I'm so brilliant, I figured this out ahead. You know, I sketch it out, and I just sort of, <laughs> but it's actually much more wonderful, because I think that a lot of this is getting at the energies we've been so taught to distrust, which are spontaneity. You know, really trusting that I really, if I had gone into doing the tarot thinking, oh, I'm a grand master and I know so much about this, it would have shut the door on me. It would have gone, what a conceited ass. <laughs> but I think because I showed up a bit like, you know, the Parsifal, a bit like the divine fool going, how hard could this be? <laughs> it went, come here, sonny. <laughs> and it took me on a thunderous ride across, you know, 17 years. But it really taught me that what I thought would probably not be that difficult turned out to be beyond difficult. I mean, I felt like my book, why I'm, I have no problem saying you should buy it, it's written in my blood. That's why, because if you squeeze it hard, my blood will. It, there are times I wept because I said, you cannot translate this. First of all, you can't translate this idea into an image. And second of all, you certainly can't translate the idea what's created into a story. Well, somehow I managed to do both. And I realized because of it, it transformed me. It changed me. It changed the way I told stories. It became more inclusive, like the wheel. Not what about me, what about my individuation, but hey, wait a minute, you're all individuated. You're all showing up. Let's make this better theater. And that's what the grail, think of Arthur and the Knights, right? Come on, guys, we can all go battling by ourselves and we can form a circle and have better conversations, have better ideals. And at the end of the day, whether we make it or not, you know what, our life was interesting. And so the books we leave in the libraries, people are gonna still be reading, because we're still reading them, right? Mm. They took the adventure. And that's what they're begging us to do. And not to leave home to do it. They did it. They left home. They're bringing us home, saying you're a knight in your own right now. And it's not battling something outside of yourself. It's trusting the grail. It's trusting that you are the outcome. 
and that your imagination will lead you, as it did me, into the mind of an ancient god. And I started to see the multidimensional story. And as we see, this is where we rise up into the room. We start to see again the environment. And as above, so below. We'll see Eve on the central pillar. We'll see above us this painting of Mysterium Cuniunctionis. This, again, as above, so below. And as we stand in the room underneath it, we are what? As above, so below. We're in physical form with it. And that's when wisdom, and that's what the cathedral tried to do, saying, listen, you're composed of these patterns. You don't need to learn this. You need to stand in relationship. And you need to trust what comes to you, because you know what? Your story's going to be different than her story. But I love the story. Like, I didn't want one book in the library. I wanted all those books. And I didn't just want the books you liked. I wanted the books you didn't like. Think of that as the librarian. <laughs> Meaning going, the conversation is far more interesting than your opinion of the conversation. And that's where we look at this sense of as above, so below. And the room itself, and we see how the heron again becomes this reoccurring motif of the chair. And not the siege perilous as in the grail myths, but really the phoenix chair that doesn't burst into flames when we sit on it, but hopefully bursts our imaginations into flames when we sit on it and we look into the room going, you know what, I think we're way more interesting than we've been settling for. Oh, Oh, actually, that's true. <laughs> Carla, I forgot about that. It, actually, my phoenix chair caught on fire. I, I did a sequential thing. I sage, you know, and I, I look over and I think, oh, very sagey, it's very, very snug. <laughs> I look over and I look at that chair and I'm going, man, that's really smoky over there. And you know that sort of, I don't know, half minute stupid we all do, you know, before you go, whoa, that's really on fire. It's like, yep, there's a, there's a, there's a, there. There, oh, I mean, and it became this getting, but I thought the Phoenix chair had to catch on fire. It's funny, this house with the Phoenix, it burned before it was rebuilt, so it, it's actually risen from its own ashes, which I thought was a good thing for the myth. Um, but this sense now of, and I realized that what, and I thought this was good for the story of the Phoenix, was that what was left was cavernous emptiness in the chair. And so I thought, okay, I see the emptiness. I can either cover over the emptiness, or I can do a little ritual and think, well, what if I put something in there? So I took crystals, I th and I built an inside. I thought, I'm going to put something in that chair. So when you sit in the chair now, over to the left, there's all sorts of things that <laughs> it should just give you a really good chi. <laughs> Unless you have a metal plate somewhere, it might just throw you off. No, it'd be, uh, <laughs> but no, it's, it's, that's why I kind of feel like a lot of this for me has been, in a way, the natural ritual of response. You know, just seeing what happens if. If you see a hole open up, put something in it just because you can, not because you ought to. Because then you have to believe in it. And then you have to wait and go, well, it's not working. <laughs> Which is really bad theater. You have to go, wait. Yes, Anne, let me put it in. Let me, because this is what, that's why prayer wheels in Tibet aren't like loud sirens go off. <sighs> because it's a whisper. It's not the exaggeration that gets the attention of consciousness. It's the love. It's the willingness to whisper a sense of, I like this story better. And that's the, uh, the story on the floor. We'll see how it, of course, goes up into the ceiling, and Newt rises over the ceiling. Everything is painted, but I love the puns that begin to be told because we see the eye beam here. And what I love is that when we look up close, we realize that her eyes are painted on the eye beam. They're painted at a right angle. And I thought, oh, I get it. We see beauty when I beam. And we understand that <laughs> human vision has to do with this right angle. It's not just what we're looking at. It's also what we're feeling. It's not just what we're thinking. It's what we're intuiting. You see, all of these, because this eye, if you think about it, never sees, right? This eye that we're born with, this sh crown chakra, this sense of wonder. That's to, <coughs> excuse me, inform our story, to let us hold the greater story and not try and get away from the black and white, the difficulty, but to hold the right angle of beauty and vision. And this story of the environment, of looking through and and these paintings, I'm not going to go into them because I just wanted to share them with you because they are on the ceiling, they're quite beautiful, and they were very much my mentors that led me while I was working on the tarot very deeply into what I found other universes that, that began to become part of this multidimensional conversation that was really saying, if you think about it, creation asks, if you do not love me, why would I love you? If you do not give yourself to me, why will I give myself to you? Why, if you think you can stand there and be entitled, do you think I will show up? You are not children. You are the outcome of a great journey of becoming human. You will always have innocence, 
and this is where your art and poetry lie. But you must protect that innocence. You must be a grail knight yourself. You must understand that you protect this innocence by your own worthiness and that what you honor with worthiness in relationship, because we think of creativity now as what can you sell, what can you brand, how much can you make, where are your demographics. That's not a very good relationship with creation. And that's why our first creation now is saying, have a story that is about this, yeah. What I just keep hearing is it's so much about being in the conversation and not, you know, it's the journey, not the destination. Absolutely. My guess is, is you probably didn't have everything totally mapped out on all, every one of your tarot things. None of it. You just... <laughs> None of it. No, I have not. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm madness that leads to a type of sanity. I, I don't have, I really don't. I didn't, because I would, I would joke with Carla. I said, okay, Carla. This is where the no thing becomes the something, where the absolute non-being becomes being. Now I'm going to draw a picture of it. I mean, it was like it was like so ludicrous to even think you could. But I started to think about like requiems and you know, there's me where people write beyond their knowing, like a cathedral. That's really beyond an individual's knowing. You know, it's almost like there's something that when you can't even comprehend it, you're forced to give yourself to it. And that's what I think a lot of this is getting at. Like the room itself. I was amazed at how many rules we have. Oh, you can't paint me. I'm an antique. You can't paint me. I'm a valuable art book. You can't paint me. What are you, crazy? You know how much I'm worth? I mean, this is really, it's interesting because you get, you start to understand, oh, we did this with our kids because it was like the kids would wake up when they were little and we never took them to McDonald's. But they go, can we go to McDonald's? And it wasn't like they watched TV to see them. It was like, how do they know about the golden arches? And you think, ah, I get it. <laughs> Mickey Mouse, the golden arches. There's an off-world training program that our kids go through, so they show up with the download appropriate to the particular age. Um, but that's just my thought. Also, with your paintings, like you spend years on them, and walk upstairs, like within like the first six months, but it's finished. It looks so good. You're like, mm, I'm not done yet. <laughs> and then like years later, you'd be like, oh, now it's done. <laughs> you know, it, it was interesting. I, I think a lot of us experience something that sort of sets us in motion. I was insulted by a friend so deeply when I started painting. He said, I don't know. No, no, no. He's, oh, no. he's the reason why my tarot is so good, though. I have to say, he was my, my truly sadistic friend that was willing to say to me, well, you know, this is, uh, this is forever. It's like... Once it's printed, it's the, this is rather puerile. That was his favorite word. He could trigger me every time, but puerile, mean, puerile means sort of aping a childlike tendency of clumsiness. And I thought, oh, but in a way, the fury from that brought it out of me. In a way, it made me work 10 times harder. And I had that happen to me as a painter. I had a friend of mine who had the devilish sense, uh, I see a tendency, uh, to, uh, especially, he was one of, he was an actor with more of an edge with, like, if I can get you in front of a group of people in a bear, you. <laughs> it's really good. So he tore into me uh, about my painting. He said, he said, he said, you think this is done? I went, yeah, yeah. He goes, this isn't done. I'd hide this. I mean, my God, you, you can't, this, this is painting. I, I and I was so like, I got so angry. And I thought this is why I say, don't, it's not about getting angry is not the problem. It's turning the righteous fury into something creative rather than killing your friend. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I did is I just said, I made a decision very early on. I said, I would rather create a few masterpieces than a whole lot of paintings. They're kind of half-assed because I kind of left them. You know, so my work really became about, like Kayla said, I just never left. In my book on the Codex Tours, all the things you see, I think that's why my technique is what it is, is I just could not leave the question because it wouldn't leave me. I once thought that most people have ideas. I think ideas have me, meaning that there's some sense, and this gets me to the grail sense, a sensed ideal, a sensed possibility. And because you're continually in the process presented with loveliness, there are times where this is lovely. This is really nice. I like this. But something says, if you stay here, it'll be lovely, but not much of an adventure. Can you do what, and then I would take Van Dyke Brown and take out a year's worth of work, take it back to the negative space, which would horrify friends of mine. Because they what are you, crazy? And I thought, no, the idea is not living. I understand why Michelangelo hit the horned Moses with his hammer, crying, why aren't you living? Why aren't you living? And that's the passion that I really feel is underneath all of this, is that passion gets us past our own loveliness, our own satisfaction with our silly opinions about things. It gets us over ourselves. 
And that's the key to us now. It's like, if you have an opinion, so what? It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is what you cultivate. Be a gardener, not an opinion. And that's the difference. That's what the grail was. That's what the tarot is. That's what alchemy is. It is this sense of, as we see going back to the Integra Natura, because I wanted to share this last part. Of we see Sophia as well here. And we start to see, again, a language that, as I say, is an ongoing conversation. That Sophia isn't a fixed, done deal. There's not like, oh, this is the image of Sophia, and this is done. What the tarot, what Sophia, all of these things do. Think of a role in acting. If you have 100 actors play Hamlet, it's always Hamlet, but they're all different. And we learn about Hamlet from each of them. And that's the key here, is we want to understand that Sophia, the way these archetypes, these stories emerge in us. Now, this was through the imagination of Robert Flood and the story of Sophia here being chained, of course, to the, the, the will of the divine, this story of the greater heavens. From her breast, her right breast is the Milky Way bringing the nourishment of life. Her, her left breast is the moon, the lunar, the hidden, the changeable, that which is process. Think of the creative process. You're going to plant your seed in the dark. It's going to have to gestate because you're a gardener. It's not something that's going to happen like that. And then we see the lunar crescent. Do you see? The chalice. Mm -hmm. We also see the lunar arc. Note that Isis and Mary all stand on the lunar arc. Because what are they? The first principle, you, life. Yeah. You, you have to, somehow, if you show this picture, you have to mention that it is a mirror. It's the mirror of nature. Oh, that's true. That's yes. what it is. And she is, not only is she, she's natura as Sophia. Because she is tied, as you see, nature, you know, right, right, right. the art is, uh, it requires the art to help nature to achieve her. Right. And there we have, uh, we have the divine uh, in influx and inspiration. And, and you see the rings of compression as well, this story, yeah, this, this sense of the, the ape, the, the, that which is using the caliphers, you see, to measure the earth, but the, the monkey mind. And the amazing thing is that whilst it appears in, um, in our beloved flood, as right. we got this book together, yes. you know, <laughs> yeah. and it came in this magical way, but this, uh, this actual uh, uh, work was Johann Theodore who made this. Johann Theodore de Debris, Brie. yes, indeed. And the flood was told that it couldn't be printed, and it was sent to Germany, and it suddenly came back with a bunch of copies of and some gold. That's the key. That's why I feel that there's a grail element that he was completely ignored, because couldn't get the stuff printed, and somebody saw it and said yes. No, that's that's the. Yeah, and I, I think that 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 story of the the engravings of the story of of the journey is part of what we're supposed to really, I think, take from it. You know, that that it is quite a work of of art on all levels. Even that it exists is astounding. And this is why Sophia, this is my Sophia, but, but she emerged spontaneously. I never, I, the great thing I have to say is I never expected to be dealing with these archetypes. I never thought I'd deal with the Adam and Eve story. I never thought I'd be, because to me it's, it seemed very presumptuous. You know, say, so I'm going to revision Genesis. <laughs> I mean, it just, it, it, you don't think that way. And, and that became the story, though, things, and this is really uh, verified Joseph Campbell a lot, because the whole point he was trying to make is we're composed of these stories. And in ancient times, the point of Stonehenge, the point of our storytelling, was that if Patrick went to a stone and, and started telling a story, we'd listen to him because like an actor or a singer, we'd realize the universe, cosmos, would be flowing through him in a unique way, a unique instrument. And we'd learn from him. And then we'd go to you. you know, we'd draw straws because it was that sense of we're in this together. And that's what the, the point of Sophia returning home is. I really feel that in her beauty, on the cabinet door, in her mind, we see the mother and father. Again, these two qualities finally coming a force, the serpent, you know, in a sense, the, the, the sheer force, the sense of the egg, the sense of the father and the mother, the sense here of the ark again. Do you see the journey of birth into time? But that we are whole and holy. And that's really what Sophia's mind carries, because she wants to show us that above her is the living grail. And this becomes the key to our story in Thoth's library, is that above Sophia is the chalice of the wisdom of the human heart that could not be known in any one time could not be known by any one person any more than the grail could be known by any one knight. Essentially, it is the ideal within all traditions 
and all uh, beliefs, all religions, that say we are a symbolical structure. We do not need to be believed. We are a tool that helps you to connect. And when you honor this, you're not fighting over the techniques and the books. You're putting your spines together and creating the grail of living wisdom. And that's why we see this story here of the infant in the base of the grail, meaning that human beings are born innocent. We don't enter the world jaded. We enter innocently. We're born into the conditions of all of these worlds. And that we are composed of the vision of universes, which means that we do bring in unique character traits. And that's what's so interesting about it, that these character traits, this quality will reach out and you see how it will move into that spine, that spine, that spine, and itself will be composed not of any one spine, but of the spines that come together. This is also the revelation I feel for me, because I always want to know, well, what is the grail? And when we think of the chalice, what became like the Adam and Eve story, all of this over and over again in Thoth's library, was this story of the living chalice of Eve, of the relationship we find with Eve and her body. Because here we see the chalice, we see the uterus, we see the cross, we see the, the womb, and the story that the masculine and feminine coming together create a flower. They create life. Mm. And that was her mystery. She said, you are taught that the cross is the cross of death, and here is sinful. I tell you the cross is the cross of life, and here is beautiful. But if you believe it is sinful, you will hate this life and want to leave. If you believe it is beautiful, you will want to stay with me, and we will begin to be interested in each other. Mm. And that's where we get our arts. The arts come from listening. You know, they come from that need to fill the emptiness with something. And that's why she shows us her single vision, her beauty. And we see this relationship taking in spatial energy as well. Because we see her and the chalice projected onto the spines of the books of religion. So we see the light of mind projected onto the story of the human journey above Sophia. And here we will move into the journey of the phoenix, all within an environment. And this is what the grail wanted to show us, meaning that when you return to the library, you will see to the right the knowledge of the mother, the knowledge of love. And to the left, you'll see the knowledge of creation and of discernment. And that's why when you look down at this point, and this brings us back to the grail, and the story here is that when Christ appeared in the grail, I was not planning to paint Christ. I wasn't planning to do, I used to kid my dad saying, it's all I can do not to be a religious painter. But it wasn't because I was, I was just so fundamentally moved by these great iconographic ideas. So when the Christ visage here began to emerge with the blind eye and the open eye and the scrolls like the rabbi, it started to tell me the story of our divided self. The story of the knowledge of the law, which is the difference between things, how am I not you? And the knowledge of love, the knowledge that I am you. And that this dichotomy in our human spirit is what is so difficult. And this is why what is so interesting is that the relationship of Christ on the floor, now think of a seed planted in the floor, meaning it's not there. We stand on this seed. That's the point of the grail. We grow out of these conditions, and that's where we see looking to the left. We look into the phoenix above. We look into creation. We look into the mirror of self-reflection. We take the long journey until finally we come to the end. We turn back. We will see here God the mother emerging from the floor with the story of the ark, meaning the story that she says, out of this oceanic beginning, out of everything being interconnected, across the ages you've created a living library, you've created a weave now that can allow each of you to realize that we are an ancient family that took a great adventure across infinite expanses of time, that rose out of the depths to create arcs, to create vehicles that could finally navigate our ancient energies without being destroyed by them. Mm. And that's Lilith, which I won't get into, and the story of the Grail Mother, which is just this story again, that she's appearing with the book, The Ankh, and the story of really this, this relationship of beauty. And this is where we see her rising. And again, there's a lot of the, the story of nakedness here is this story of, of innocence, meaning that we stand nakedly before creation. We emerge toward that sense of possibility. And I think of this as a grail image. You know, we strive toward creation. We strive toward the blossom. We strive to be worthy. And in that striving, then, we finally turn back. 
And here we see the hidden one, or Lilith, which is another story for another night, but this is the story of the goddess of Lilith, the chalice of wisdom projected onto the spines as the chalice of the human story above Sophia. So you can see how this is taking in the entire environment. I just want to share these. I don't want to talk about these are my Codex Tour, just to get a sense of space, and then we'll move out of this. But these were just questions that were asked visually that began to open more and more a sense of story, the monad, the sense of the waters, and then the sense of what's behind the wiring. That's why the language is saying, pay attention to these concurrences. And that's why everything from the heron showing up here is that I started to realize that what we so aggrandize as myth is actually what Joseph Campbell was trying to say is no. Myth occurs in our life if we pay attention. And it's the unexpected, in a sense, a slightly odd, ordinary acting up. There's a bird in my house. Either I could say, oh, there's a dumb bird in my house. But when I saw him, I had the presence of mind because of lucid dreaming to not get like this, but to actually blurt out Thoth because of the heron, because I knew that. And that focused me. But when he looked at me and went, look, 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 that's when I almost passed out and said, I'm <laughs> not really religious. Is this where someone shows up in a puff of smoke? And, and that's when he went into his dialogue. But it was, it was fascinating about how those, it's like the upstairs. In a sense, we're, we're facing that sort of liminal state between the imaginal and the, the material. And that's where our dreams are. That's where the answer to our questions are, because that's, in a way, the emptiness that the Buddhists talk about in the heart. If you think of that emptiness as the crucible, if you think of that as the grail, if you think of that which is not, meaning that because I am not, you must seed me with what you would like to draw forth. And because it's not something that will be done like that, because it will grow like any seed, attend the seed. Worship, honor, nourish the seed. Do you see that sense? Because then we're starting to say, I'm not looking for outcome. I'm attending life. And therefore, life's going to be far more surprising than an outcome. Mm. And that's what I have to say about my art, is that it's really life, because I'm just astounded that this has been the outcome. Yeah, uh, also, you're talking about that. The, the Codex Tour is what you took everywhere with you. Yeah, this actually, I traveled the right. world with this, oh. and this was 24 years. But this was a way of asking questions, do you see, that I couldn't answer verbally. I, I wanted to know, who am I? Where are we? What's the, you know, how do we connect with our energies? And this became a type of celestial map. This became Earth, and you are here. And I thought, well, it doesn't have to be real. That's the imaginative energy I felt when I was working with it. And that's when ideas become free. Because mm. we're not burdening them with the gravity of, I need you to be true. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's almost like, lighten up, kid. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not the proof of anything. I'm the beginning of a relationship. And that's the thing about our arts. Everyone goes, I'm such a terrible artist. It's like somebody does in the art. I say, close the door. Don't share your art with people that critique you. Critique has replaced creation in this culture. So if I can judge you, I'm done. Hey, I don't like that. Let's go have some lunch. <laughs> Thanks, that hurt. Um, you know, and this is where I really feel we have to be wise. We have to be grail champions of our own inward purity, our own inward innocence, our own mm -hmm. inner sense that this should not be shared outside of my gates. But I should not stop sharing it where I live. And that's really a question that takes us through all of these questions of mine, which were, can we look at imagination? Can we use the tools of art simply to ask questions? And I say, from what has happened in my art, the answer is a remarkable yes. Because I always thought of myself as an actor who painted. Do you know, I, I use painting as a way of asking questions. And that's why it took me back to this sense of why, in this last bit of part, I thought you'd enjoy. Because I've talked about mothership, and I told you about how some of the drawings influenced me. And when, when mothership came about, this story of her and the story of the twins, and we'll also see how this is a tremendously alchemical uh, image of the grail, because we'll see the twins and the, the, the chalice. Uh, and we go a little closer. We can see that we are both born as male and female, umbilically connected to the apple, the gift of the unique artistry of human consciousness. And that this golden chalice is actually the gift of life. And that life, although we don't recognize it yet, is an unbelievable gift. Unbelievable gift. When we get off planet and we realize what we didn't do, it's like, you're kidding. How could we get it so wrong? And that's why a lot of people leave with a groan rather than the sense of yes. <laughs> and this, I want to show you this, this relationship here of orbs. Because we notice here how everything is of orbs. And I just thought I'd share what happened around the time the heron showed up. 
Carla was reading a book out loud, which is great. Nothing like painting and having your wife read a book out loud. She was reading about Gurdjieff. And she starts saying, get a camera. You've got to photograph this. And I started taking pictures. And you'll see these orbs. And they're not just coming out of the painting. They're spiraling. They're all over. There is a remarkable. And you can start to see how my paintings with the orbs actually have orbs coming down out of them. Now, I would show these people, to, uh, you know, these pictures to people, and then I started getting these ridiculous conversations. Well, you know, that's just dust, or that, you know, that. And I thought, I'm going to be an ancient Greek here, guys. I'm not going to tell you what it is or what it isn't. I'm going to look at it for what it's telling me. That's why the conversation over crop circles, you just want to kick somebody. You say, come on, God bless drunk Irish guys made them, okay? <laughs> Being an artist, I know that ain't true. Because I'd love to see the creative level of those drunk people that do these things with panels and boards. Do you know, in a sense, there's a conversation going on there. What is that conversation? A picture language. Why are there no names signed in that? If I sign my name, I give you someone to blame. Mm. If I don't sign my name, I leave it up to you to engage or not engage, for you to reject or not reject. And the only thing I am is a Rorschach test of your character. <laughs> and that's the key to these things. So when you see someone, oh no, that's just a reflection of their character. No insight into what they're looking at, because they're not looking. And that's why these, these, the, the orbs inside, you can see how they're creating a DNA strand in front of the painting that will create the DNA. So there is a conversation going on. And what's interesting about these orbs, they're not outside of the mirror. I'm shooting into the mirror. <laughs> So they're only inside of the mirror, <laughs> which is impossible. And here you can see they're looking into the mirror. You just took them with a regular camera? Regular camera, about three different cameras. It was an inundation. What was it, but what was interesting was that I started to realize I'm a cave painter. I put, the, I put the heron in, right? It came into my house. I'll put it in. So I started putting these things in, the orbs. And there were even these things that looked like uh, light ships. I mean, this looks like a UFO, right? That's not that. This is in the mirror. This is actually in the mirror. And you can see this, 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 what I think of as a type of black hole propulsion system, but that's just me, with a type of craft inside of it, but that's just me. You know, it might just be a smudge on the... Yeah, the, the just <laughs> yeah oh yeah, no, it was, it was quite astounding. I, I, I really, I mean, it was one of those things because, but it was, it was changing the conversation because I realized the 20th century conversation was the battle over the debate over what is it. As opposed to the new conversation, what are we looking at? Let's stop being comfortable by figuring out what something isn't. That's called living by negation. That's called living by critique. And we've gotten so good at critique. And guess who we are the hardest on? Ourselves. And the whole point of mothership, which is this painting that comes from this, is she says it's not enlightenment. It's enlighten up. The orbs are your energies. They are atoms. You are filled with effervescence, life, and you exceed the boundaries of what you think the limits of your own form. And that's why her story is, she says, now I can show you the story of the grail, the story of the chalice, meaning that each of us are born through the mother as male and female. But that the secret of the chalice is the secret of the blood. And the secret of the blood is I am all parts of you always. Therefore, you cannot exclude any part of me. And there are no evil atoms. So you can't remove that which you think is evil. Because what you think of as evil is the story you are convincing yourself is true, which includes, oh, that's evil. Mm -hmm. And you see, that's why we have to stand in the center of the wheel and say, no, that's archetypal. Cain killing Abel has never changed. Why? That's not what changes. It changes us. It makes us conscious. It allows us to choose. And that's why we can see her in this remarkably large kachina saying, oh, I am so generous. I bring you home finally, this relationship, she says, of joy. And we finally come full circle to Sophia and the library that says we are the outcome of the gathering through this great quest for the chalice, for the grail, for the container that would hold not the knowledge of one of us, but the knowledge of all of us that would finally say to be human is not to be at the exclusion of any other human, but to stand proudly in the story of being human. When you do that, you come home. And that's why all of this artwork takes us in a conversation across the ages. It takes us from the cave paintings, where it's paint and storytelling. It takes us through the romances of the grail, of the stories of Arthur and the knights, the desire to be worthy of what we are seeking to know through alchemy, which says you are that which can transmute base consciousness 
into golden consciousness, but you must do the work because alchemy is based upon the first principle, life, not concept, not math, life. You are alchemists. Your question, your science is life. So the question tonight is, how do we find our way home as the outcome, not of the rejecting of anything, but of the great work of the magnum opus that said Thoth's library went out into the world to gather the books so we could come home realizing we're the outcome of that gathering and we could put the stories together in a way that makes us say yes rather than yikes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>